Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Jenny Glenny. I'm going to be chairing the session this afternoon. Uh, welcome to you all. I see we have about 60 participants. I hope that number is going to be increasing um, as people come back from whatever they've been doing. Um, we do have quite a busy afternoon, so I don't want to delay too long, and there are always introductions, so let me start on time. Um, first of all, we are delighted to have a really well-qualified panel to be leading our session this afternoon on Open Education Resource Textbooks. I'd particularly like to welcome Richard Sebastian um, from far, far away, who got up very early this morning in order to participate with us. Uh, Richard, I hope one of these days you'll be able to join us uh, for a visit in South Africa. With luck, we'll be face to face. And <laughs> Gino, I'm delighted that it's raining in Nelson Mandela Bay. Perhaps this will stave off ground zero, day zero, whatever it's called. Um, so let me just introduce the panelists. I think you will see how qualified they are for, for this particular discussion. Um, uh, Gino, since you're on screen at the moment, let me um, welcome you in particular. You're a project leader. You're from the Nelson Mandela University, um, and you are an open education influencer. So great that you can join us. Uh, then I'd like to, as I've already done, welcome uh, Richard Sebastian, but to introduce him. Uh, he's a director um, at Achieving the Dream, director of open and digital learning at Achieving the Dream. And many of you will have been privileged to have heard him address the Achieving the Dream conference that we participated in in February of this year. Um, and then we have a team from, um, UK, uh, from UCT. We have Glenda Cox, um, who is the uh, senior, uh, senior lecturer at UCT. She's in the Center for Innovation, Learning and Teaching. Um, and is also, I didn't know this, well done, Glenda, you're the UNESCO chair in open education, one of the UNESCO chairs in open education and social justice. Um, and then from UCT as well is Michelle Wilmers, I hope I say that correctly, um, who's the publishing and implementation, um, implementation manager of digital open textbooks for development at UCT. And finally, we welcome Tony Lelliot, uh, who is from Sadie. Um, Tony Lelliot um, comes with a, he's a program specialist at, at uh, Sadie, specializing in teacher education, but he also co-leads one of our Sadie initiatives, um, OER Africa, which has been going since 2008 or seven or eight, um, and works with um, academics and librarians across universities in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, Tony is the co-leader of that project with, with Neil Butcher, um, whom I'm sure many of you know. Um, so welcome to you all and thank you for, for joining us. Um, I would like to start this session um, by having a short video, just for those of you who are not so familiar with what the term is. Um, and the, it's about a two minute video, so I hope that will help to bring everybody Sort of close to the same starting point in this discussion. Um, and then after that, I will just identify some of the questions we hope to answer, both in the discussion and in the panel presentations today. But let's start with the short video. Uh, so books that are licensed in such a way that enables them to be um, adapted by faculty who want to use them as teaching resources, so make modifications to them that make them more appropriate for the teaching and learning context. And the other big benefit of them is that they are free for students in the electronic versions of them. So there's a couple things that make it special. One is that ultimately out of this project we will produce 60 open textbooks um, that can be used by anybody uh, in our post-secondary system or anywhere in the world, um, free to adapt and free to use. Uh, and the other thing that makes it special is that it's the first government uh, funded initiative of its kind in Canada. 
I think open textbooks are going to change the world. Fundamentally, the reason we're doing this project is to increase access to higher education by lowering the cost. So if people don't have to pay for textbooks, then that means that they're more likely to be able to afford to go to any kind of post-secondary education. And that just opens up the world of education to a much greater population. So my experience with going to this book has been very seamless and that um, the, the book that I've adopted is, is on par with anything else that's already existing. And it's very high quality and its structure is very similar to the presentation, it's what I used to. And um, it's not really been much of a transition. Despite the fact that it comes free, the quality is as good as anything you see. It's been great, you know, we spend so much money on textbooks every semester, um, it really adds up to the cost of tuition, and it's nice to be able to go online, just download the chapters that you need, you don't have to carry this giant textbook around with you, you can just upload it to your computer, and it makes life really easy. I wish that all of our textbooks were free and open. Well, thank you very much for showing that, that video. I hope that that assists us. Uh, certainly in South Africa, this is a major issue. We've been supporting at SADI some staff members who are doing qualifications, some of them because they're working at UNISA. Um, and the cost of the textbooks from our experience in supporting those students is often more than the tuition fees. And so this is a really important notion that we are um, discussing here this afternoon. So in the course of the discussion and of course in the presentations, we are going to be asking each member to present uh, in about 10 minutes their take on open education um, resource textbooks. Um, but we do hope by the end of this discussion to have explored some of these questions. Um, why do we need OER textbooks? We've got some of the answers already. Uh, what do we expect the purpose of OER textbooks to fulfill? Um, how do you make them? And how do you address, how do you support staff to find them and to use them? And how do you address quality concerns? I'm not expecting every presenter to answer those questions, but I think um, amongst the presenters, we will begin to answer these questions and there will be some time thereafter for, for discussion. Um, so if we may start with you, Gino, um, for your first 10 minutes. We'll follow with, with Richard and then the team from UCT and finally Tony from Saints. Of course. Thank you so much, Jenny. And um, thanks for to Sia Pumalela for the opportunity to share some of the work that we do. But more than that, like to actually provide a platform for open education resources. And in this session in particular, for um, open education resources uh, and open textbooks to take the forefront. My, my session is, is gonna be quite a whirlwind, okay? So what I've done is, if you look in the chat now, I put in the link there for where you can access this entire presentation. If you looked at the video that was shared now by Jenny uh, from BC Campus, it was License Creative Commons 4.0 or 3.0. Ours are likewise licensed like that. So you can use the content, you can share the content, you can edit the content. It's not restrictively licensed in that copyright circle. Creative Commons means access to resources that have been licensed by the creators. I will share my screen and um, I'm going to go really quickly like i said but again i have a video that i'd love to show you um, towards the end of this so i'm going to jump into my presentation and just f5 and let's go full screen so my name is gino Franzman. i'm the project leader for the open education influences or always open ed influences at mandala uni and my presentation here is titled empowerment advocacy and collaboration with open textbooks and you'll probably see like as we go along that i do try to focus on each of those terms and i'll actually signal it out okay so what are always always or open ed influences are ambassadors for open who increase awareness of open education resources and open education practices. Those are both uh, shortened 
how do I take this thing off here? Sorry, my apologies. Those are both shortened to abbreviations. So OER is Open Education Resources and OEP is Open Education Practices. What do we do with these things, right? Always facilitate the adoption, creation, and licensing of OER. Open Ed influencers energetically advocate for the use of open textbooks across purpose, faculties, and schools. Why isn't this information being made accessible without restrictions? In 2022, always facilitate the creation of open textbooks as they do all of this. You'll see there's three images there, and those are previous teams. In 2022, we have Lindsay, who is a master's in law researcher at Mandela Uni. And she says that she sees awareness as key. When students are aware of resources freely available to them, they are able to take ownership of and invest in their own futures. We've got Hannah Tablange, and Hannah's a third year student now who's an aspirant music therapist. So Hannah says that open resources have the potential to bridge a gap where there are so many challenges of access for students to great quality resources. Our team has been contributing to what we call the Bowie course, which is really an abbreviation for becoming an open education influencer. And they've done this in so many ways. So when we were speaking about empowerment, our team were empowered to be able to create learning and teaching content that's literally traveling around the world as we speak. So what did they do? They brainstormed, they sourced open content. So these are things that can be shared in your LNT um, activities without the restriction of copyright. And students can copy, make photocopies, but they can also share. Educators are able to take that content and remake, remix, repurpose. They did practical research. I'll tell you more about that. They developed or co-developed a structure for the course and for the six modules. And I'll tell you about those now. They help with script writing. So if we're looking at professional development, you'll see that the OEs are capacitated like very few other in the course of helping to open up education. And then they've been collaborating both online, locally and internationally. Uh, one of our students was actually on a keynote panel at OER, um, the conference in America last year as well. So, Open education influences. Sorry, I've got this thing on top of my screen, which is really um, disruptive to me. Anyway, so the Open Education Influences project looks at empowering students and staff to achieve personal, community, or professional development goals, and not just to speak about it, but to do something about achieving it. So it's learning by doing. The Bowie course, which is becoming an open ed influencer is one such vehicle. And it's also part of the UNESCO Open Education for a Better World Global Mentorship Programs outputs. So this year I'm the hub coordinator for Africa and we've got several uh, projects which we'll be taking with to the Global Eduscope in Slovenia in September this year. Also, we'll be releasing a call for new projects for open education for a better world. So if you think you've got something that can help take education into another level, reach out to me. My email is on the last slide. So in Bowie, there are six modules. Ubuntu, this is Africa. I am because we are, and it's such an empowering con um, conversation to start off this journey of becoming an open education influencer to change the world of education. Second module is open. We want to know about open. We want to know about Creative Commons licensing, open textbooks, and so much more about how you can start embedding open into your practice. Well, of course, if we're going to start doing this, we need to have a module on advocacy. We need to take this to people so that we can share. And how do we share? By facilitating conversations. These facilitations because of COVID very often happened online, but likewise, there's a face-to-face, -face, no longer mask to mask since today in South Africa, um, conversation that very often needs to happen. However, these conversations can sometimes be challenging, especially if you're a student. The locus of control, students at the bottom, educators above, which is something we're really trying to fight against these days, right? Student advocacy. So students need to influence decision makers from a point of belief 
to shifting that belief somehow towards incorporating open. And of course, we exist in, a, in, in, in the world. So the sustainable development goals situate all of these activities. Here are the steps for enrolling into Bowie. So Bowie is on our openly available, openly accessible platform called engage.mandela.ac.za. Like I said, you can access all of these steps a bit later on when you click on that link. What have students said about open education resources while doing the Bowie course? So in 2021, one of them said that, I had no idea what this meant, but after watching the videos and reading the notes, I now know what it is. But I'm very surprised that the education system in South Africa isn't exploiting this cost-effective and efficient way of delivering high quality education. Read the, the rest later. There's so many voices in here. So we asked students about their experiences with traditional textbooks before we could ask them really about open textbooks. Yeah, you might want to bring your face closer to the screen and have a look. These are just some of those um, responses. Textbooks are a waste of money. We pay enough to be here already. Having to buy a textbook for only one semester is very expensive. The amount of money spent on textbooks in first and second year was ridiculous. And if we just look at that at the bottom of that statement, is a tiny little thing there. The cost of textbooks has impacted my degree to not being able to purchase them all. Leads me to falling behind in my course. We literally don't want that. So we asked more questions and we use Question Pro as an online tool. This wasn't the, the biggest sample in the world, right? But the sample tells a story about a common occurrence across our student body. So how many textbooks do you purchase in a semester? What's really, really concerning to me is the fact that you've got 35% of that students who say, I don't purchase any, any textbooks. We asked them, has the cost of the required textbooks ever caused you to do any of the following? And again, that gold one there, number four, where my cursor's on, it says earn a poor grade because I couldn't afford to buy a textbook. Look at this light blue here, not purchase the required textbook. These are problematic and we need to do something about it. So we ask students, what do you do when you can't afford a textbook perhaps? Hmm. If we look at this, deeply problematic again, if you look for where my cursor is now, this purple here, if we go across this range of responses, all of these are problematic behaviors that students either engage in or find themselves within from using a reserved copy from the library, which is expiry um, link, right? You only get it for a certain amount of time. Share books with classmates or friends, that's dodgy. Um, scan selected text and share PDFs, that's illegal. Borrow books from a short loan program, again, time bound. You don't have it next week if you have it this week. Take photos of selected text materials, copyright infringement, download illegally online. Mm. Print materials and disregard copyright, an outright response, problematic. So then we ask them, well, you know, open textbooks are free, they are available to download. Um, have you ever heard of it? Are you familiar? Seven to eight percent of them said no. We asked them, would you use an open textbook if it was in green, free, in blue, shareable without restrictive copyright, in red, it could be printed, in gold, it was created for your course, and in purple, it's from another institution. Students said, yes, they want this. So in 2022, what have we done? Um, we started a new cohort of open ed influencers. So we went through recruitment, empowerment, induction, and we are now in action. So we've launched the Open Textbook Fellowship, which is now in pilot stage number two. Uh, stage one was in 2021. And now we are going into stage three, which, which kicks off now in July. Are you coming this near is the what end it looks Yes, this is what it looks like. So our Open Textbook Fellowship has content that looks like this. Um, very important, of course, when we're having a collaboration about books and, and learning and teaching resources, 
we need to involve the library. So we've now got a formal collaboration with the library. We are setting up curation support for identified, for the resource scarce and high risk modules. And then we're establishing an open content repository of Mandela learning and teaching resources, not just the big stuff, but the small stuff that contributes incrementally to the bigger picture of the academic endeavor. Last year, in terms of advocacy, uh, we had an open ed colloquium hosted by Conrad Koch and his satirical puppet Chester Missing. You can click on that link and watch the, the, the preview. It was hilarious, but more than that, it's a motivator and an agitator to disrupt, decolonize, but also to develop. You can watch our latest media content, and this is one of our current open textbooks that's in production. It's called Open and the Arts, and we look at five different performance arts um, mediums, and we are creating introductory modules to take aspirant performers through the process and to be able to earn a living. Our mission and our message to you as I leave is use our support, use the content. Like I said, it's openly licensed. Spread open and make change real. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram using the Open Ed Influences hashtag. Also at the bottom there, you see that URL um, that takes you to our YouTube channel where there's tons and tons of resources for you to understand more, but also to get you involved with us. Finally, collaboration. As you can see, this project is not about one person who's here representing a ton of efforts and so much more inspired contributions from people all across the world and all over South Africa. From Nelson Mandela University, we say change the world and my email address is there as well as the link to our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gino. And was the video going to be from Chester? No, the video is actually about Nikki and the open and the arts. Um, okay. Well, if we have time later, we'll Roger. come back to you. Uh, particularly Thanks, if we have a, a, a gap in questions. So thank you very much indeed, Gino. Um, that was uh, both entertaining, inspiring, and a lot of fun. Um, so let's move over now to, to Richard Sebastian from um, Achieving the Dream, and we've already got uh, his presentation. So over to you, Richard. Thank you. I, I, it's early. I don't know if I can match uh, Gino's uh, energy. and um, It would be hard. What right, but, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard act to follow, but I'll, I'll try. I'll try my best. Can you see my slides okay? <laughs> Okay, so uh, I am, uh, good morning everyone uh, from the United States and good afternoon to you. Um, I'm from uh, Mercer Sebastian, I'm the Director of Open and Digital Learning at Achieving the Dream. Uh, we're based in the uh, Washington DC area in the States. Um, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our approach or our view at ATD uh, around open educational resources and, and, and based on a couple of projects, research projects that we've been leading for over the past six or so years. <clears throat> little bit about achieving the dream, um, the kind of areas of, uh, that we work in, we have a network of colleges, uh, we work on innovative practices and advocacy for uh, different educational uh, approaches and solutions that, that that are evidence-based and, and show promise for colleges, um, insights into college, you know, what through toolkits and other resources and what's successful at colleges, and really a focus on whole college transformation, which, which I think really sets achieving the dream apart. We work with, you know, the president and a cross-functional team to really make these changes throughout the institution. Uh, and we work with primarily uh, community colleges or community and technical colleges, two-year colleges here in the States um, that often serve uh, students who uh, are uh, racially minoritized students, uh, often uh, poverty-impacted students um, that, uh, uh, you know, are, come to community colleges oftentimes because um, they're less expensive than four-year colleges. And uh, we have a, a kind of an access agenda to, to uh, kind of open door agenda um, for uh, students who want to take courses uh, at colleges. Uh, <clears throat> so we have about 300, over 300 colleges in our network across the United States, 45 US states. <clears throat> have served about 4 million students or more 
And we also serve high school students through our um, Gateway to College program, uh, which is which is newer. We've, a couple of years that we've we've had that achieving the dream. <clears throat> so we focus on whole college transformation uh, initiatives that have promised to uh, uh, impact students broadly uh, across institutions. And so uh, the about 2016, I um, uh, was. Uh, uh, hired at ATD to, to run this uh, program called the OER Degree Initiative. And, and really the, what the premise of this was, was that um, the model of OER adoption, uh, the degree model, or sometimes it's called a Z degree model, um, would lead to kind of a kind of deeper uh, adoption in uh, student outcomes at, uh, at colleges. And so uh, over a course of uh, several years, um, uh, this uh, initiative was run looking, uh, looking at uh, this kind of degree model and its impacts. Uh, so it was one of the largest uh, uh, foundation funded projects at the time. It involved 38 colleges across 13 US states. Uh, and the goal for them was to build uh, two year pathways for students uh, of open courses. So technically a student could start, you know, uh, start their, their, their college experience and move through their degree program without paying any textbook costs. And uh, parallel to that was a research and evaluation study, which looked at what does it cost for an institution to, to ramp up these kind of programs? What are the uh, impacts on students? Um, and what are the benefits of, of, this, of this model? So we looked at academic uh, cost and implementation outcomes um, of, this, of this program. And, and there are some really interesting findings, really promising findings that I think um, confirm our, uh, our conviction that uh, OER adopted kind of at the institutional level has, has a, can make a huge impact. So uh, part of the cost study, which is a subset of the, the, the grantees, so there were 11 colleges in this cost study, six of them, uh, students at six of them earned significantly more credits. So they took these like, you know, series of OER courses over the course of two years and <clears throat> use those savings to take more courses and earn more credits, which is what we want them to do, right? And that's like the coin of the realm. We want uh, them to do that. And also, um, you know, we know that students who kind of can accelerate their journey through community colleges have uh, more chance of success. So about three, three credit hours was the average um, over the semesters in the study period. Um, we didn't see any differences in racially minoritized students or Pell students, you know, and students, uh, different uh, student groups that seem to be um, the same across them. Um, also, uh, there's a, you know, of the subset of colleges, uh, we studied five on the kind of the costs, um, the research on costs of this program, and three of the five colleges actually recouped their investment, which was significant. In addition to the grant money, they invested on average uh, almost half a million dollars in these programs. Um, and that was, you know, without a whole lot of structure from us, um, you know, the, the colleges kind of did this on their own um, and they actually kind of broke even or two of those three colleges had positive net re revenue. So they actually made money over the course of the, um, of the project. Um, and so there's a lot of promise there. You know, if you, you think about it, if students can uh, earn more credits, right? Um, so they can uh, pro progress to degree more quickly. Uh, institutions that invest in this can recoup their investments, break even at least, or maybe even make money uh, if they uh, implement, kind of the deploy OER across the institution through the different, you know, more sections and through uh, degree programs. So uh, course enrollments can lead to higher credit accumulation. Um, but also, you know, developing uh, OER titles is, is an expensive endeavor. It's free to students. Well, for institutions, it costs money. And we, we, should, we found that it costs a lot of money for faculty to kind of sit down the, the true cost. And that we, we know that faculty get stipends or maybe they get release time from their courses to, to develop an OER, but that's not the, the, the true cost. We studied like how much uh, institutional resources were used and what actual amount of time based on the faculty salary. And there's a really detailed economic findings, um, really suggesting that, um, institutions need to support these efforts, support faculty uh, to help uh, kind of leverage 
um, this, this activity is going to lower costs uh, per, per textbook. But, but, but again, even, even with those higher costs of development, um, we, we saw the institutions do, do pretty well uh, break even or, or um, actually make money. So we released uh, these in a, a, a series of reports with the final report being called OER at scale. Um, I'll drop a link into the chat um, once I'm, I'm done here if you want to access those um, findings. Now, now, based on the findings of, of this initiative, once it was over, I'm working with the research team at um, SRI Education. We had some other questions and things that emerged from the study, which was reports of faculty uh, using OER in innovative ways, changing their pedagogy, right? So to kind of adapting uh, to kind of new forms of, of teaching and learning as a result of adopting uh, OER. And we wanted to know more about that. And so we got a follow-up grant to uh, do another study called Teaching and Learning with OER. Uh, so we were looking really broadly at the last one, looking kind of institutional, looking across the US. And this, we were looking at um, eight colleges, so eight community colleges, that um, you know, reported having faculty, so the faculty there, or you know, where there's a culture, uh, as well as you know, faculty practicing what we call open pedagogy and uh, culturally responsive teaching, which I'll talk about in a second if you're not familiar with those terms. Um, I think Gino did mention um, open pedagogy a bit. Uh, so these eight colleges um, you know, had faculty kind of doing this work in the classroom. And so we wanna know what, what does that look like what does the use of OER look like? How do they kind of engage in these activities? Uh, so we look at open uh, educational practices. So that's teaching practices that use the affordances of open licensing, that uh, use the ability to revise material and share material uh, to combine different uh, uh, OER together to make new uh, material. Uh, so they reported, you know, they were using, and to some degree, these practices, but also, uh, looking at culture responsive education. Uh, and, and this came to the forefront really um, powerfully in 2020, summer 2020, we had the kind of reckoning with race after the murder of George Floyd in the United States um, and, and some real kind of thinking in higher ed about um, uh, kind of structural racism kind of built in to higher ed just as it is in a lot of institutions in, in the United States. So culture responsive education really looks at the student's identity and uses that as an asset, right? Kind of in, in, in embeds that culture and background into the learning, right? Uh, uh, and, and so the students feel kind of uh, seen and they feel part of uh, kind of the course, they see themselves in the content. So here's an example of, a, of, of an instructor, just to give you an idea of, of using these, these practices. Um, so uh, James Ross Nizal, he's an instructor at Houston Community College in Texas in the US, um, teaches US history. And uh, as he moves through his kind of uh, history curriculum, as they did hit different eras, he offers students opportunity to uh, produce, you know, research and produce some new content ar around that period of time in US history of interest to them, right? Uh, and so, you know, for example, uh, this group of students, uh, uh, looked at interwar America chapter and looked at serial killers. Before we knew they were serial killers, right? Like um, uh, they identified kind of uh, 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 what, what looked like, you know, kind of the patterns of serial killers before we had a name for them, right? And kind of reported on that. That was something that they chose. It had connections to the content and it became part of that open textbook, right? So they were producing content for the next class, right, incorporating it into, into the course as knowledge generators, right? There were, um, and so um, uh, that was the kind of activity we were looking for and wanted to know more about in this study. So some other students did the pop culture in the 70s on black exploitation, disco, and martial arts, which is a fun uh, essay to read, uh, as well as more serious 80s foreign entanglements looking at um, some of the, uh, you know, U.S., um, uh, foreign policy during that time. Uh, so, so again, they're, they're helping author this textbook. And what we found and what the researchers found um, are five, what we call five dimensions of open and culturally responsive education practices. So this is kind of what you see when you combine uh, the kind of open educational resources, right? The, the kind of 
uh, what you can do with the open licensing, how you can uh, manipulate and use this material, uh, and then combine it with these other practices, right? And so we found five dimensions uh, that, that, that kind of emerge from the student agency and ownership. So giving students a voice or choice or leadership over learning, similar to James Ross Naval, right? Like they, they can choose the topics of their essays, uh, including inclusive con uh, content that has diverse perspectives, tailors content to students' needs and interests. So it's not, uh, content that's you know Western focused or European focused, as it often is mass produced, it can be tailored to specific populations or students and their interests. Uh, collaborative knowledge generation, you know, students have the opportunity to apply, evaluate, and create new knowledge, similar to the history students creating kind of chapters for the, the textbook. Uh, critical critical consciousness, um, there is a uh, awareness in a, a kind of uh, the discussion of kind of social justice issues um, that uh, that that kind of are tied to the topic of the class or the, the, the discipline, and then classroom culture, a strong culture of relationships between between the students and between the students and the teacher. Uh, you're creating safer spaces for them; uh, they feel welcome, uh, and they're uh, you know the, the instructor kind of. Um, ensures like their backgrounds and identities are, are kind of seen as assets and things that can be um, uh, uh, kind of celebrated and used in the class um, to, uh, to help tailor the content. So we put those together into like a framework, looking at components of course design, right? So course design, instructional materials, teaching practices, assignments, and interactions. Kind are, of you elements. To, are you coming to an end soon? Yes, I am. Um, uh, and uh, within each of those squares are a little kind of like what that looks like when you include student agency, for example, in course design or teaching practices, right? And we're mapping those to uh, examples and activities in a faculty guide that we're producing. But, but it's a, a, a kind of a, it helps uh, faculty kind of narrow down and, and find places where they, or opportunities where they, they might be able to incorporate these, these practices into their classroom. And uh, that is also, uh, uh, in a report that was released just a couple of months ago. Again, I'll drop that the link in the chat once I'm done here. And that is it. Um, and, and just to, to summarize that uh, Achieving the Dream, again, we, we think the institution, just like in distance learning, you know, we've seen these investments, in infrastructure and staff that benefit students and, and help move courses online and provide kind of online education. And, and it's, you know, I think there's a similar opportunity here for institutions to invest in uh, a, uh, a tool, if you, if, you, you know, if you think of OER as a tool to help students progress to graduation uh, uh, more quickly, to uh, give faculty more freedom to uh, uh, revise content or incorporate content that reflects their students' uh, backgrounds that, that, we, that show, you know, uh, there's neuroscience that shows that, that, that kind of when students feel welcome and when they feel part of uh, the, the, you know, feel that they are students, right? Even though they may be first generation students that they do do, do better, they get better performance. Uh, so we think that there's a lot of promise with open educational resources, but you really, uh, the institutions are the, you know, the, that really need to um, kind of invest in them and scale them. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you also for elaborating on the dimensions of open educational practices and our I must say I like your framework um, of um, that you, you presented in the in the last while. Yeah. But great findings there. So with that, can we now move on to um, the, the Cape Town team, UCT King team? Michelle? Yes, Some, Linda. Yeah. yeah. Michelle? It's Michelle's birthday today, by the way. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. I won't sing, I promise. <laughs> Michelle, Thanks. would you like to share the slides? <laughs> I've just put a link into the chat. And okay, thank you. Share my screen, Len. So we're going to do a little joint presentation. Um, well, thank you very much for for everyone for being here in the room. It's very exciting to have so many new people um, 
and very exciting to hear the presentations of Gino and Richard. Um, and we're going to be kind of overlapping, certainly. Um, there are themes that, are, that come through in all our work, um, but hopefully we've got a slightly different take on, on some of the things. So um, at the University of Cape Town, we have the Digital Open Textbooks for Development project. Um, and Michelle and I are core team members, and we have a third member, Bianca Masuku, um, who's not presenting today. So we are situated in the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town. And we've been uh, doing work with open education for many years now. Um, and a lot of it is maybe, yeah, um, a lot of it is externally funded. In fact, most of it is externally funded. Um, and I think this is one of the points that Richard was talking about that it's, it's really now time where we can try and get institutions behind these initiatives a little bit more. And we will talk about that a little bit later. So this open textbook project, um, can you go back, Michelle? This open textbook project had three particular aspects to it. It had a strong research component. Um, and in a nutshell, our research has revealed the relationship between creating open materials, in this case, open textbooks and social justice. So that's something we've really explored in depth is that relationship. Um, it also included um, an advocacy kind of arm, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about advocacy right at the end, um, and then had this implementation aspect. So um, we had grants to give academics at UCT some money to develop open materials. So this was a wonderful opportunity for them. Um, and so we have researched those open initiatives. So we had this great kind of nexus of activities where we were both implementing, researching, and then could build on advocacy work. And the, 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 the great thing about this is all these years of open work since 2007 at UCT, finally, we now have this Michelle's um, position and Bianca's position as being um, funded by the university. So we actually have people working on open education. Um, I only work on open education one day a week out of, out of my, um, with all my, my other academic roles. So this is really, really encouraging and exciting moment for us. Okay, Michelle, we move on. And the Digital Open Textbook Project came at this time when there was um, this, this need for change and transformation and it was built, the proposal itself was built on that social justice premise that I talked about. And this, this structural inequality that was existing then has been exacerbated more recently with the COVID-19 pandemic, where not only in South Africa, not only in the global South, we're seeing structural inequality, exactly as Richard pointed out to us. Um, this is something that's in global classrooms. And now is the time. These authors, Williams and Wirth, have written this great article. Now is the time for intentional disruption on the part of the institution. We need to institutionalize this to really transform. Okay, Michelle. And when we were embarking on the social justice, as we started looking at what was happening with these open textbooks, we started to realize how exciting it was to have student-centered um, approaches appearing with these open textbook authors. They were really using the students to collaborate with them, to work with them. And so we've combined our social justice literature with this wonderful literature on students as partners. Um, and that's what we're currently working on at the moment. Move forward, Michelle. Um, and in terms of social justice, our open textbook authors, um, when they asked for this money in the beginning, we kind of said to them, well, what is it that's driving you? Why do you want to create an open textbook? And these are the kinds of things they came up with. So we've heard the argument about affordable access, and that was a big, 
many of them said, well, you know, students just cannot afford these textbooks. But then this area of curriculum transformation came to the fore. A lot like what Richard was talking about being culturally responsive. Um, and we've, so we've called it curriculum transformation per se in our language, in our institution. Um, and in that we saw calls for multilingualism. So that's something really important. And also this idea of localization, which dovetails with Richard's concept of cultural responsiveness. Um, and that's where the localization comes in. And then we also saw amazing pedagogical innovation, um, this idea of changing the classroom completely to, to redesign how, how activities happened to include students in the content creation. Okay, so in, in the interest of time, I think we, Michelle, was this your side or mine? I can't remember. I think it was mine. Um, you're muted, um, but that's fine. Um, so, so we've already discussed features of open textbooks. We're not going to go back into all those different things, but the, the two pieces in red were important for us that they came, this has come out of our research, the power of open textbooks for social justice, in that they are so collaborative and inclusive in all aspects, whether it's authorship, quality assurance, and that quality question will come up later, and publishing. And that because of this kind of inclusiveness and collaboration, we've developed sort of sustainable models of open textbook production um, that we feel can truly transform the way academics are teaching. Michelle, I think it's over to you. Yes. So, um, hi everybody, I'm Michelle. In, in my capacity as the publishing and implementation manager of the dot for d project, I got to work with this group, this cohort of academics at UCT. Um, most of them um, received grants from us, all except one. We're also grantees in the grants program that Glenda referred to. You can see a wide um, spread in terms of disciplinary focus. And just side note, we didn't um, encounter, observe any particular disciplinary dynamics related to open textbook production in general. Perhaps sometimes in computer science, um, a prof, prof Keat would say, um, my students don't like to write. Um, Com sci students don't like to write. So, you know, there were those kinds of nuances, I suppose, in terms of disciplinary difference, but no, none that you would generalize upon. Um, so, yes, over a three year period, we worked with this group of academics tracking their journeys as they embarked on wanting to produce open textbooks. They had quite different ideas of what an open textbook was or what it would look like and what shape and form it would take. We weren't um, kind of uh, prescriptive on that front at all. We were interested in innovation and we were interested in resources that could make an impact and, and address some of these injustices and these, um, these challenges that Glenda mentioned they were encountering in, in their classrooms. Um, combined with that, we were pretty open in terms of genre, kind of technical genre and format that um, academics wanted to produce their content in. So in some cases, it was pretty straightforward, like you would imagine authoring content in a Word or Google Docs and then doing a typesetting process and creating PDFs. In other cases, um, it, we really tested the idea of what an open textbook is, and if you like, what, what a book is in the digital incarnation. Um, as part of our work that we did, we've produced a series of journal articles and, and book chapters, but we also produced this monograph in which we wrote case studies of every single one of those authors that you saw there detailing the journey, that's the, the various journeys they went on. And we thought of it always as a journey because of highs and lows. And um, just to say, not all of the authors featured completed textbook development processes. 
that was really important for us to grapple with as well and understand. And it feeds into this idea of a journey. Um, all of the authors had good intentions and did various degrees of work in which they could move things along. Not everything resulted in a published textbook, but it didn't mean that the process itself didn't have value. Um, so if you're interested, please have a look. Um, there's a collection of case studies there. It highlights some factors around sustainability and the budgets also that these initiatives worked with and particularly how they worked with students in various processes. As part of our work, Glenda mentioned, we've been exploring different collaborative models that are focused on student co-creation, looking at different degrees of collaboration across publishing authorship and quality assurance. Um, some of the, the highlights and lowlights from this work is that we could see in six initiatives, students took on various co-creation roles in authorship to varying degrees. Um, writing and researching contents, developing graphic material, um, wide array of, of roles and responsibilities. In two initiatives, students were co-creators in quality assurance processes. So critiquing, reviewing, testing, piloting content. And authors found ways in which to not only capture students' lived realities in the authorship process, but through this also to get their feedback in quality assurance. We did see that none of the initiatives brought students into publishing processes. Our feeling is that it's because the, the, the idea of being a publisher and of undertaking this kind of publishing work is very new to many academics. So academics themselves are still grappling with these new roles and responsibilities around publishing. So I think it explains some of the tentativeness mm -hmm. perhaps in bringing students in. Um, but we could see that student participation was a critical aspect of addressing inclusivity in the classroom. Very quickly, just to mention, um, as part of the advocacy work, which Glenda mentioned, we're always thinking really hard about supporting academics through this work. As, as Richard touched on, it's expensive in, in many ways, in terms of time, energy, um, these processes, they, not only are they time intensive, they work over long protracted cycles of time often. And so the institutional support is, is critical. We're now in the third year, we launched an open textbook award at UCT. It is an initiative of our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning, which is focused on recognizing teaching innovation that supports social justice and transformation, particularly in these areas that you see on the slide. And that's just, there are some links to the 2021 and 2022 award winners to those resources, if you're interested in having a look. Glenda, I want to hand back to you. Okay, very briefly, what's next? I know we're running out of time. Um, um, yes, please, you must start to close up. Okay, <laughs> no, we're almost done. It's, this is going to take a couple of minutes. Okay, the next, so our next step, so we really want to get the student experience. So we've been working with authors and not students. So that's our next step, um, looking at this idea of students as partners um, in open textbook production. And we've kind of got this sort of title that we're working with power identity and the reconceptualization of content practice. So the students are our emphasis now as we move forward. Um, and then why we're so excited to be here um, and something we really want to move forward on is to try and get a, a South African network of, of, of um, high education open textbooks going. Um, and we had two meetings last year, which some people were present at, and this is something we'd really like to move forward on. Um, and we keep plugging at this idea of how we can perhaps um, extend our network and extend what we've learned. I think that's it, Michelle, for now. Okay, thank you very much to Michelle and to Thanks. Glenda. Is there anything more from you, Michelle? Or are you okay? No, all good, thank you. I'm going to stop sharing as soon as I figure out how to do that.
Somehow they stop. Oh, there we go. We stopped sharing. Excellent. Thank you very much to, to both of you. Um, I'd like now to, and, and for this exciting initiative, particularly if one can be thinking of how um, we can develop a South African network in, in this regard. So um, to our last speaker, which is Tony Lelliot from OER Africa and Sadi. Um, so Tony, if, if you would like, if we could hand over to you. Sure, yeah, thanks very much. And that's great to hear the other ones. I'm gonna keep it fairly brief so we can um, get some discussion in for our break. Um, uh, as Jenny mentioned, I um, am one of the co-leaders of OER Africa and uh, that's the top of our website. And if you want to look for it, um, oerafrica.org. Um, the work we're doing at the moment is actually um, working with professional development of um, uh, main academics and librarians in higher education institutions uh, that relates to their implementing OER practices. So that's the work we are we're carrying out. We're um, just about to get into an, a new grant for the remainder of this year. Um, so what do we do at OER Africa? Well, obviously that's what we do. Um, that's a lot of stuff that we, we, we concentrate on. Um, we also have on our website quite a lot of open courseware, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, we also work with open access publishing to some extent, a limited amount. And this area of open textbooks is not something we've been um, working with particularly over the last few years. Um, but obviously it's coming to the fore with fantastic um, uh, innovations like the one at NMU and the DOT4D. Um, you know, it's something that's really get, getting up. So it's, some, it's an area we'll be moving, moving into. Um, they have tended to be less common in developing country contexts. I was actually in a, running a, um, a very short presentation for some librarians this morning, or well, lunchtime, uh, in Free State, and um, uh, from here, from, from Johannesburg. And um, they were saying, well, aren't all open textbooks really based sort of in America and Europe and Australia and stuff? So, um, and to some extent that's true, but it's great that there are these innovations that are going on here. Um, as we've heard, they're difficult to produce. Um, and in, in some, depends on the case of who's doing what. And it, um, I, I was very interested to hear the, the, the research that Dr. D has been doing because there clearly is some learning design in some of the books there, but that's not the case in all books. And um, many academics think, well, the quality of these things, how good is it? They always ask that of OER. So we have to, so, so we have to sort of think through those things. So um, we would say that context and localization is extremely important. And of course, pedagogical issues can be included within, within those sorts of books. So how to address these? Um, we would say um, start small. Um, the um, collating and curating OERs is a way to sort of build up towards uh, um, thinking about an open textbook and developing obviously open courseware modules is also a step towards them. Um, but then instead of jumping right in, one could actually look at existing open textbooks um, and adopt them uh, as a possibility. And then of course, to adapt or modify um, those existing open textbooks. And finally, you can actually create open textbooks themselves, uh, but you probably at the same time should think about learning design. So what about adopting? I've got <coughs> some um, link here, which we will be sharing, sharing with them um, uh, when you obviously you should get this PowerPoint presentation. Um, but um, adoption in five steps and also BC Campus, which has been very prominent as you, that was the opening video was from uh, BC Campus, uh, today's session. They've got an adoption guide you might be interested in if you're not familiar with. What about adapting or modifying? Um, a, there's a, a, a very useful uh, guide to that, modifying an open textbook. And um, another, a different one from uh, another organization <laughs> six steps to doing that, uh, to adapting open textbooks. Um, and then finally, creating one. I think both um, Gina and Michelle uh, and colleagues will agree that it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, 
but there is a coal guide to this, um, 2016. It's mainly based for schooling, but there are lots of interesting ideas in there. Um, and then, of course, there's quite a well-known um, a text called The Guide to Making Open Textbooks with students. Uh, it's an edited book, but um, uh, it's uh, also well, well worth looking at. So um, finally, um, what about learning design? Well, you know, um, you can, even when creating an open textbook that might be quite technical, you can incorporate various pedagogical approaches in, those, in such a textbook, student-centered and innovative. Um, you obviously need, to, we, we mentioned localization earlier, you need to have the content accessible and local and relatable context, very important. That's the whole point of creating a textbook for a particular context. Um, interactivity and practice, very, very important in, in textbooks as well. Open textbooks can be incorporated and um, li obviously links to relevant multimedia, which again would be open open uh, educational resources. So um, that's basically it. I thought I would go rush through. So we've got uh, 15 minutes or so for, for discussion, Jenny. So that's what I will do and I'll stop sharing. Happy to answer questions. Thank you very much indeed, Tony, um, for all the panelists. There have been um, uh, lots and lots of food for thought, lots of resources shared. Um, but I am keen to hear various questions from the floor. I don't see any that have been put up in the chat. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that um, there will be some hands going up. Um, and I'd like to, to give you an opportunity to, to do that. Um, in the meanwhile, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about the uh, students' involvement. I think this is a really, really exciting um, possibility. Um, and, and even if it doesn't, if it ends up to be part of a textbook or incorporated in some way in the textbook. Um, and I'm just wondering, often the examples that are given to us are examples that are kind of like pretty obvious in history or something like that. Are there any examples that um, we have got in science, in maths? Um, obviously, agriculture could be an area where they are student created. So I just wanted to open that question to, to the panel. I can give uh, one example. Uh, Thank you. So, so, so there's this idea of you know, creating uh, textbook content. There's also um, practices of having students uh, develop the kind of assessment questions, right? So they oh. develop uh, questions, whether it's math or you know, in STEM, what we call STEM uh, areas. Uh, and you know, maybe they're peer reviewed and then reviewed by the, the faculty member and the, you know, can rise up to become part of the kind of assessment process. So, so that's another angle to that, you know, uh, that, that, that students can contribute and, and have their work kind of uh, uh, be part, become part of the course. Thank you very much. Any other Any ideas? Other? Thank you, I also just add something here of that, that group of grantees that I showed in the slide. Two of the initiatives were in mathematics. Um, and there was an initiative in statistics as well. The statistics um, case was really interesting because it was a really focused on multilingualism and um, is it close the translation. Um, and then the maths initiatives were focused on what a GCT is called a, um, some people call it a killer course, so uh, targeted as a, a course impeding graduation, the, the Maths 1000, MAM 1000W, um, and uh, great barriers to success on, on that first year maths course. And so two initiatives were actually focused on um, addressing first and second year maths education at UCT. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions? I still don't see any in, in the chat. Um, both all of you, and I think Tony was right to be picking up on this matter, identified how, how difficult and time consuming, and as Tony said, not for the faint hearted, uh, to develop an, an open textbook. Now he did present various ideas at the end, 
of uh, how one could could start on that journey rather than undertake the whole journey. Um, could that be a, a possibility? UCT, you were talking in particular, and uh, Gino, I think, keen to try and involve others in um, in, in the possibility of creating more and more open education resources open and on the way to open textbooks. Um, is, is this something that we um, can, can consider? Is it something that can take off? How would we do it? Would we need resources? So, so Jenny, I'll, I'll just add something here in terms of the, the conversation that we've had in that open textbooks in South African higher education forum, that last slide that Glenda showed in the presentation. What, what we thought, um, you know, talking about inter-institutional conversation is, and, and collaboration is, is all good and well, but we know collaboration is hard, mm. time consuming, etc. cetera. Um, we thought what could be practical is to find a common focal point and common focal problem that institutions across the board want to address. So particularly looking at issues, for instance, like curriculum transformation, and particularly within of that, perhaps looking at mathematics education. Um, so consolidating efforts around problematic areas in the system, and then also the idea of collaborating across curriculum, which is really tricky and perhaps a lot more challenging to consider that, um, you know, if in a, in a, imagine a scenario, if there was a first year mathematics textbook that was developed by academics and students from 10 South African universities, and wherever there was particular specialist expertise, they produced one chapter, another chapter came from pre-state, et cetera. So um, that idea of us not all reinventing the wheel and going on trying to make our own top quality resources and spending those resources in silos um, was something that we were looking at very hard in that, that national level conversation. Question now in the chat. So let me just oh, um, carry it through. Um, and so uh, Colleen says, I'm curious to know what you mean with multi multilingual texts, considering that examinations are usually conducted in English. How, you, how do you develop and foster linguistic coherence, especially for future studies? Um, I think that question is clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, we had, um, so we had the statistics example, um, and then we also had first year chemistry, which is another one of those really tough first year courses. And um, the authors there felt that certain basic terminology, it would just be much easier access point for, you know, second, third language English speakers to have those definitions developed in a number of different languages, um, South African languages. And they got students to help to do that, um, to, to develop their own um, definitions and add them. So it, it, I understand what you're saying about the examination, the coherence, but this is just a way of, an extra way of helping students to kind of just access and understand the concepts and then being able to go to that translation step, you know, back into English and so on. Um, it's definitely a, a big need for that, um, at, at, especially in those big course, first year courses. So yeah, I think it's really important. Colleen, would you like to follow up? I'm, if we were in the in a, um, a a very large venue now, it would be so great. I would love to have a show of hands for people who have heard of open textbooks and open education resources, because it's it's always difficult in this environment. So many people here, um, and I, I do wonder um, how many people uh, actually know anything about open textbooks. I think Gina, you know, you have something to add. Yeah, <laughs> um, like I'm coming from from the point of view and, and, and sort of that action of of advocacy about like raising awareness, um, but but more, I think it should be empowerment. So staff should be empowered to have this conversation. And I think that 
that your question was so appropriate because when we when we know what we speak of and, and refer to then we are able to really engage meaningfully with it but a lot of people are still confused about basic terminology and think that an ebook is for example an oer without knowing the conditions that make an ebook an open education resource so like having those conversations with people who who know what they are saying when they're saying it in in a more sort of empowered way i think is 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 really critical for us to enter into this sort of action part of what we are looking to do um, but still do the people we want to do this with and who we should do this with um, are they with us in terms of that understanding and and that empowered status of knowing so empowerment and then for students the same thing thank you very much gino um, colleen responds um brilliant we find that lecturers who use that that's the translations in their classes is such an essential step but she goes on to ask how aware are curriculum developers to encourage embedding these resources in their course design i know of several educators that insist on material they know and trust and would love to know how to encourage them to embrace such opportunities so awareness i think that that is speaking to that question gino has has started um, to to answer it um i would just like to add from a siapumalela perspective i mean one of the things that siapumalela does is offer a range of services um so um it is really very possible that we could add such a service uh, to begin with in a more elaborate um uh, introduction to, to open education resources, really getting a hang of what this concept means. Um, it is a paradigm shift. And so it sounds simple once you have it, but to get it is not necessarily so, so simple. So we could certainly, we could certainly do that. Um, the other option that we could consider is, is thinking of a work stream in Siapumalela in this area, um, which we have had, I think I mentioned at the beginning, there are a number of, um, work streams um, that we have that have, have then uh, been a platform for institutions to get together and then something can come out of it. It doesn't have to be continue to be led by Sia Pumalela, it can be um, branched off, off somewhere where else. Um, so those are our two possibilities um, that we should, should look to. Um, and uh, there's another question about uh, the quality again. The quality of OER must surely vary. Is there a framework of sorts to evaluate OERs? Uh, would somebody like to answer that before I jump in? <laughs> Tony? Tony. <laughs> well, yes, so there are there are a number of frameworks and uh, there are some very good ones and we've got we've written about this. Uh, on the OER Africa website. And so I would reckon there are some very, very complicated ones and then people get horrifically bogged down. We find uh, just having a simple one is the best thing. And um, uh, just uh, the, the basics of, of what the, you know, how, how can you trust the source and all those sorts of things and then reading through and the quality and how does this fit with what you, what you the content you want to cover, et cetera, et cetera. And then Alan is mentioning in the in the chat that if you if you have good learning design, you can actually get the students to evaluate and improve uh, OER. So that's my. Thank you. Answer. Let me just ask members of the panel for a, a last word um, from far away. Richard, is there anything you would like to to say? Well, for, first, thank you uh, for allowing me to uh, be here this morning. Really uh, learned a lot. Uh, from the other members of the panel, and, and thanks for the questions. And I think um, uh, some way that I frame my understanding of OER, and it's not completely historically accurate, I don't think, but it's, uh, it's around the emergence of cinema and film, early, early film, right? Cameras were big uh, and stationary, and essentially early films were like plays, right? You were just recording plays and, and watching them later. So we hadn't figured out the language. We hadn't figured out the, the affor true affordances. And I, I think that's true with OER. I don't think we've figured out or seen it as the kind of transformative tool it can be and uh, could significantly alter kind of the roles of faculty and, and you know, who become faculty or what, who does what. 
and how we think about content and how we think about uh, collaboration amongst faculty and institutions as well. I think there's a lot of potential that needs to be explored. Otherwise, it we are becomes just replication institution by institution, right? Which is really, you know, it is expensive and, and it's hard to pull off, but really using the, the, uh, the, the ability to, to um, share and collaborate, easily collaborate and learn, you know, in the process of your faculty member, here's a great activity. That was a great move you did in the classroom. I'm gonna use that, right? And, and, to, and to create like a, a, you know, a professional uh, network as well that you can tap into. So um, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful with the, the, the scale of adoption of OER currently um, and, and, and us going in that direction. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Gino, anything to add? Um, I, just, I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I think that us helping other people to understand and to enter into the domain is is something that is going to be so important and so beneficial once those people just know the potential of open education and and more especially open education resources and how they can get their work out there licensed appropriately always attributable to them but also counting as professional development um, on the screen you know, so there are so many opportunities for open education in South Africa, and I'm happy we could be here to speak about it. So thank you. Very much. I really like that you've done that survey. Those figures from students were extraordinary about the number of students who do not buy textbooks. And goodness knows how is it then um, that you can can manage to um, yeah to really engage with your with your course. Thank you for that. The UCT team. Um, yeah, I'd also like to just say thank you so much. Uh, I think this is a, a really important moment that we can share, you know, what we've learned over the over the years um, with such a wide audience, and we really appreciate that. And I do think that um, often we tend to talk to other open educators, and it's so nice to to be challenged with an audience that that might have heard this for the first time. Um, and I hope that we've, I think, managed to capture your imaginations in terms of the potential of of this work but it does it it's taken us all all of us here a long time to get to this place um but i think it's an exciting place i mean i had a conversation today with somebody who's doing curriculum transformation and from um, uct and going to be managing grants across uct and i kind of said to her well do you know about open textbooks shouldn't we be thinking about the power of an open textbook within that framework and she, Yes, and, and it was a moment for both of us where we realized that actually this is an important link. It's about making those links and hopefully we've, we've made some linkages today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Tony, finally. Okay, um, just to say that I think um, because lecturers, my experience is lecturers know that students don't buy textbooks a lot of the time, and then they produce a, quite a complex course that does, sort of can be talk to the students without them needing uh, to use a textbook. What I would say is um, if, if, if people could actually then just um, think those through a little bit more and then openly license them, then they are a step towards um, open textbook in a way. So um, it's, it doesn't have to, as I mentioned in my presentation, you don't have to go the whole hog and do it all at once because uh, some institutions may find that too daunting. Thank you, Tony. Right, to all of you, thank you very much for your participation, for your enthusiasm, for your passion for social justice, um, and using some of the tools that we have available now and the concepts that we have available now in, in order to uh, take that agenda forward. So I hope that this has been an informative. There are wonderful links in the chat. Um, we need to collect those and make sure that those are, are shared with everybody. Thank you and thank you all again for your presentations and your engagement. Uh, we thank now you, have Jenny. a comfort. Thank you. We now have a comfort break and be back again. I think it's at forty twenty-five. Am I right? Um, for some uh, partner presentations, um, these have all been enormously exciting. That's to date. So please join us again 
uh, for our two partner institutions this afternoon, WITS and UCT. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Jenny, really? uh, Alan tells yeah. me it's 14.30. Thank you. Okay, 16.30. 16. Sorry, 16.30. <laughs> I apologize. 16.30. Are there more things in the chat? Let me see. All right, just thank you. Jenny, Sriyash yes. here. Yes. Hi. Is it okay if I just practice sharing my presentation quickly? Of course. Thank everybody you. please go and have tea while Riyashna does yeah. it. <laughs> yes, everybody go have tea. <laughs> Save the suspense. Yeah, no, we're watching you, Riyashna. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's make sure. So this should be slideshow. And Riyashna, I don't know how to say your surname. Sittledean. Sittledean. I would have got it wrong. <laughs> well, at least you got Riyashna right today. You often call me Riyashni. So. That's true. <laughs> I was spelling it and I suddenly realized that there was an E on the end, an A, <laughs> not an E. <laughs> All right. So let me do share sound, share that, and then share screen. Right, sure. Is that sharing, Kende? Yes, that's fine. It is. Yeah, it is sharing. But okay. uh, you don't need to look at your notes, uh, Reshna. I have my notes on my tablet. Oh, very high tech. <laughs> All the tech. <laughs> Two devices. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, OK, great. Yep, uh, so get that up. There we go. Stop share. Great, 16.30, we're all ready. And I think Fitz has got a, a video. Um, so um, Kevin and Fasila will make some introductory remarks and then we'll join the video. Well, I welcome back everybody. I hope that you had um, good tea and feel refreshed. Um, and I hope invigorated by all the possibilities of open education textbooks and resources. But meanwhile, let's get back to some of our partner presentations, and we're going to be starting with uh, UCT uh, with Riyashna Siddledean, um, who will be presenting for us. Um, so um, you've already done a trial run. You know it works, Riyashni. <laughs> Riyashna, sorry. Um, so over to you. Thank you, Jenny. I am, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can. You know what? I just realized that I'm supposed to share it with the video, with the sound. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, thank you, everyone, for for still being here uh, at the end of a long day. And I know many of you are sitting in very cold weather, as am I. It's pouring outside my window, um, and hopefully the rain will not be come too loud. Um, so. Today I'm going to be presenting the work of Supermalela at UCT, um, and I'm doing it as a sort of progress report, as I did last year, and only this year I'm doing it on two years of our partnership with Sadie and the Kresge Foundation. So while I am uh, the institutional lead on Supermalela, the work that I will describe today is a collaboration of efforts um, it's from across a wide array, array of UCT people and functions, and is supported by the portfolio of the DVC Teaching and Learning and the Dean for the Center for Higher Education Development, or um, CHED. So last year, I presented our work describing the system we were planning to build or aiming to build. We haven't built it yet, uh, but today I'm going to take us a little bit further along this journey. And you'll see on my slide, I've highlighted this word system because this is what we are thinking. We are thinking systematically. We are thinking about building something that works as a system. But before I get started, I would like to introduce you to our acting DVC of teaching and learning, Professor Harsha Kartar, uh, who will tell us a little bit more about UCT's vision with working with Sia Pumalera.
Always gonna happen. Okay, apologies for that. Uh, that's now suddenly not playing and it worked perfectly this morning. So let's try that again. Oh boy. Okay, I'm going to go off of slideshow mode and see if that works. <clears throat> well, otherwise, you could forward it to us and we can try and show it. Yeah, that might be necessary. It's quite big. Um, um, Alan right. would be a good idea. Alan, are you there? These things happen. Yes, I'm here. Um, I've had I two dry runs this can... morning and it worked perfectly. Uh, the so. Makato is saying I'll share the link. All right, okay. The Makato, if you can share the link, the frame or link, and I'll play it, then it, they can play it. Sadie can play it. Makato, who are you sharing it? With whom are you sharing it? <laughs> um, just give me a moment, I'll share it now. Um, do you want to continue, Riyashna, and then we can come back and frame it, or would that upset you? Sure, sure. We can do that. In the meantime, uh, Dimakato, can you get both videos ready in the meantime? Thank you. All right. Typical. Okay. Share screen and move on to that. Let's show from begin. All right. Um, so there's where we would have heard from our not, BBC. We're not seeing your screen. Or oh, I'm not seeing your screen. Honestly. There's some horrible little goblin somewhere. <laughs> Clearly, Dimakatsa and I had two, two trial runs this morning to make sure this worked. All right, Should, are you seeing it now? Yes, we are, thank you. All right, okay, so this is where we would have seen the video and we will show that at the end. So as part of our grant conditions, um, UCT as a partner institution is, institution is charged to deliver on three goals. In today's presentation, I will speak to each of these in turn and come back to our systems thinking and how they fit into our systems thinking at the end. I'm going to start with goal two in which we are to offer at least one service to the network each year. You will see from this slide that we, in year one, we offered two services to the network and in year two, we have offered three. The first being a diagnostic assessment in higher education, which was offered by the Center for Educational Assessment as a two-day workshop. And the second was Introduction to Design Thinking offered by our D School, which was a three half-day series. And finally, this year, we will introduce digital open textbooks for transformation and student co-creation as a two-part series offered by colleagues from the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching, whom you just met. For goal three, we are to play a leadership role in a regional sub-network, which, which in our case includes the University of the Western Cape and the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Engaged with our re regional partners, we established a program of workshops on student success that would ultimately allow us to each work towards developing our own institutional success frameworks, but that maintains threads of continuity. Our first event on defining student success was well received. We kept the number to 30 people to, in order to um, maximize meaningful engagement. What you see here is a creative summary of the workshop generated by a graphic illustrator. And yes, we do have a more traditional report as well. 
But from the workshop, as you can imagine, we established that no success definition works for all contexts and perspectives. Instead, we were able to establish a set of principles that would guide a context specific definition, depending on the work that you are doing. Our second event was themed measuring student success. And this started with a reflection on the first workshop on defining student success and ended with an argument for the importance and value of developing student, a student success framework. The workshop concluded with some practical guidelines on measuring student success. And uh, it took into account the conclusions of our first workshop and gave a number of um, adaptive uh, measurements that could be taken. So we now have uh, two more events scheduled. These are on factors impacting student success and the second one on supporting student success. And we will be planning a review and consolidation workshop um, that will look at how we integrate the work that we have now covered. But let's get back to goal one. So goal one for UCT is to implement or expand evidence-based decision-making processes to support institutional leadership, student support, and faculty management to improve throughput rates, time to completion, and the removal of performance disparities for, for different groups. So what I'm going to do now is talk about some of the initiatives that are engaging with goal one. I want to be quite clear here. Uh, the initiatives I'm going to talk about are by no means complete. They are some of the, they are in various stages of development. And I want you to think of them more as trajectories of work that we are on rather than completed projects. And this is partly due to the challenges I know we all face and, and, and we'll come back to that um, towards the end of this presentation. But just to give you a frame of reference for how we've gone about this work. So we, what we've done is we've used two baseline tools for constant reflection. The first are the, um, our ICAP recommendations um, that, and, and, and the pieces or this, the strategies of work that were recommended from that activity. And the second is a sort of heuristic device. It is a map of the components that are needed for building a data analytics and student support system at UCT. This is not continuously revised as we engage with more stakeholders, we do more work. And in order to really understand how these um, strands of work will come together, the four strands being the student experience, student performance, uh, interventions, and ethics, how do we build these is, is by building the components first. So the components of the blocks that you see. And the mapping exercise is to, for us as a team to establish what exists within UCT, what exists in part, what needs to be developed from scratch, and what is uh, already being developed in different parts of the institution. And this is where our CEO Pumalela activities and collaborations um, start to come together. So at UCT, Sia Pumalela has been largely a coordinating mechanism, bringing together stakeholders and projects that help us build our system. The first uh, and most, one of the most more important projects in terms of contributing to our data analytics uh, for goal one is the data analytics for student success uh, project. This is currently a small team of people led by Mr. Stephen Marquardt from SILT, and we meet weekly to engage with both operational needs and strategic projects in data analytics. In terms of our strategic work, guided by our brilliant Sia Pumalela coach, Prof. Wendy Kilfoyle, we set up two wildly important goals or WIGs, which are aimed at using meaningful data and visualizations to inform on student and system performance. My colleagues, um, Stephen Marquardt and Kende Kefale, presented a piece of this work at Sia Pumalela this year. So if you're interested in this work, I suggest watching that video. Another important collaboration is um, through a UCDG in academic advising in which myself uh, from the academic development program in collaboration with the Deputy Dean of Commerce um, are using the Commerce faculty as a case study for the development of a new model for academic advising. This project is about a year and a half old and you can see the diversity of activities already concluded. 
case studies like this are extremely important because conceptual frameworks are all well and good, but you have to test them against the real world challenges. We have also constituted the Sia Pumalela Student Support Working Group, which is a cross institutional grouping aimed at improving the integration of student support services towards improved student advising. This is chaired by the Director of UCT's Career Services, Ms. Brenda Martin, and you will see that the group represents a wide range of both academic and non academic institutional functions. Together, this group will be using case studies of registration and academic recovery to map key advising points on the student journey and think about how we might integrate support across these services. This grouping is about a year old. Sia Pumalera also partially supports a number of advising initiatives. Uh, here I'm going to talk about UCT's Central Advising and Referral System of Services, which is a product of the academic advising at UCT. CARES uh, constitutes a central help desk uh, with four faculty specific help desks that allow for efficient information sharing and referral for students seeking help. CARES counselor is a service for any student needing um, support and often acts as a triage uh, before a student can get to student wellness. CARES reach is an ad hoc service offered to staff who need to contact students. And our chatbot is an automated smart FAQ with live user connection to CARES agents. Now, every component of CARES is designed with integration and improvement in mind. They all speak to each other, sharing data, and as well as data collection protocols. And these serve to help us better understand the student experience, um, particularly in the areas of information and help seeking. If you'd like to hear more about the development of our CARES bot, this was presented by my colleagues Megan Bam and Dipti Charitar in this week's conference. This year, we are also piloting with the Career Service a skills plugin into their CRM that allows for the explicit making and cataloging of progress on graduate attributes. Lastly, again in collaboration with the Academic Advising Project and CHED, we launched an initiative for academic recovery, which aims to model the use of peer-to-peer -peer advising as a resource, create an opportunity for developing a student tracking and case management system, and collect student participation and peer advisor experience data. In this week's presentation, you may have also seen a pre uh, another presentation by Mr. Polite Nduru on the m and &E frameworks we have been developing using Pambili as a case study in practical m and &E for educational intervention planning. Now with Pambili, we have really engaged in what it takes to embed students into structures. You will hear now from Simba, a Pambili peer advisor on his experiences so far. So this is not going to work either. Um, Dimakata, have you shared the link? Yes, I have shared the links with the host and Alan. Thank you very much, Dimakato. Um, Alan or the host, please, would you play this link? Thank you, Alan. Okay, this is this is the one for DVC, but we can listen to that. We can watch this one first. We have no sound. Hello, I'm Professor Harsha Cathard, Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor for Teaching and Learning at UCT. At UCT, we are now almost at the end of our second year of partnering with Siapo Malela. This has been a synergistic partnership as the goals of Siapo Malela resonate strongly with UCT's Vision 2030 and our Teaching and Learning Strategy 2025. 
UCT has laid out an intention to support student success in all our work and in doing so to innovate towards future readiness. This partnership has strengthened UCT's work in the adoption of evidence-based approaches to student success, which are humanizing and that put students at the center. At UCT, our Siapu Malela grant has supported our efforts towards developing a holistic system aimed at empowering student success through technology and data-enabled advising in particular. It has also allowed us to pilot a number of new services in academic advising, including a new program for academic recovery. Our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Mamukheti Paking, has stressed that effective analytics is a critical capability for understanding unsatisfactory performance patterns related both to race and particular fields of study among UCT students. Sia Pumalela is part of UCT's vision for supporting student success and excellence through student support, academic support, and learning analytics. My role as Acting DVC of Teaching and Learning allows me to bring together a wide range of academic and non-academic perspectives on how we as an institution can enable and empower our students towards success. To this end, we have been developing an institution-wide integrated data analytics system that will be specifically designed to produce the kind of meaningful data that will underpin the development of interventions to, st to support student success while also improving the quality of teaching and learning. Learning and growing with the Siapo Malela network is an important part of this goal. Thank you. Thank you, um, Alan. Can you please play the second video now? So this is a peer advisor in our Pambili Academic Recovery Plan program. Um, Simbarashe who will be speaking about his experiences as a peer advisor in the program. Alan? Um, Dream's team will do it. Hi, my name is Simbarashe Nyota and I'm a final year chemical engineering student at the University of Cape Town. I have a great passion for renewable and sustainable energy. I've been a student peer advisor in many roles, including being an orientation leader, which included making sure that incoming first year students feel safe and included. I am now also a Pambili peer advisor. Pambili is a peer facilitated academic advising program for academic recovery. In this role, I work with groups of students from my faculty by leading monthly interactive sessions designed to make students aware of the resources they have access to and help them tap into the academic potential. As a Pambili peer advisors, I have facilitated three sessions so far, preparing for each session by attending a training workshop. The first session was based on appreciative inquiry and strengths-based advising, in which we helped students plan for their academic recovery. Together, we brainstormed about academic goals for the semester, followed by designing the things we need to achieve to meet those goals. The second session focused on designing to achieve this goal. Since we're now more than a month into the semester, we used the session to reassess our goals and aspirations. The third session encouraged help seeking behavior. We did web of connection exercises to help students identify different support groups for financial, emotional, and academic support. The fear of being turned away, looking needy, and surrendering control were common reasons that made looking for help difficult. Pambili uses a very structured approach. We use an online venue banking system we have recommended session outlines and reporting templates. 
Peer advisors also have a WhatsApp group to organize ourselves to operate more effectively. My role as a peer advisor has helped me strengthen my communication, leadership, critical thinking, and academic skills to maximize my potential, while we're helping others do the same. My experience in the Pambili professional environment has been an opportunity to contribute to a team while positively impacting fellow students and the university. It has boosted my confidence and I've learned that trusting yourself is key to building confidence and can motivate one's success. I believe that the Pambili Academic Recovery Program is yielding positive results. Thank you. Thank you, Harsha, and thank you, Simba. So I'm going to go back to sharing my screen and completing my um, presentation. Okay, so let's move on from this slide. Okay, so um, we've also been developing, on the uh, continued theme of student engagement, we've also been developing guidelines on how to engage the student voice uh, for greater impact. And Precious uh, Mahlaflela and Makati Sebatoma uh, did a presentation on this um, in this week's offerings. So now we reflect back on where we were last year and the work that I've described today. You'll see in the blue font, we've made uh, progress on a number of our threads, uh, including uh, an, a development of an ethics framework. We're about midway through that. I haven't talked about that today. And in the green font are some components that we have now added to our work streams as well. So where does this leave us? It leaves us with this question of, uh, is it time for a UCT student success framework? Most of you will be familiar with Tinto, uh, who said that few institutions have a coherent framework for student success. Instead, most have a laundry list of activities and interventions. And I think most many of us are familiar with this concept. But what a framework does could do for us, according to Grayson, um, is that it could provide us a common statement of purpose in relation to student success. It provides us a set of principles to guide what we do. It gives us action guidelines for what we should be doing as a community. And it allows us to develop uh, mechanisms to monitor our success in advancing um, uh, student support. And then finally, how do we bring this all back to uh, systems building? So for those, I'm not gonna give a lecture on, on what a system is, but those of you that are familiar with um, systems, it, having a framework moves us closer towards an, an envisioned system. Why? Because it provides this over a defined overarching purpose or goal. Uh, it provides opportunities for developing mechanisms for feedback. It gives us motivation for data sharing across the institution and it is impetus for integration across projects. So my last slide to say thank you uh, is to acknowledge that this work has not been without its challenges. Some of it has been in uptake, some in integration, and some in, in what I would call institutional resistance to change. Now, this is not always people or money. It's sometimes it's structures, sometimes it's processes, sometimes it's IT platforms. Uh, but we persevere and we navigate these challenges, always learning. And I'm sure that the next year's report will show to continue to show a trajectory of progress and growth. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Riyashna, and for being so composed, at least externally, <laughs> as we navigated uh, this presentation, but well done. Um, there isn't a little bit of an opportunity for some discussion before we move, or some questions before we move on to, uh, to the WITS presentation. Um, I've asked for them in the chat. I don't see any so far. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Could you put your hands up? I'm not sure I can see the whole group, but let me know if I don't. Um, Riyashna, I just wanted to ask you a question that arose in, in one of the concurrent sessions today. Um, and big universities often have problems of decentralization. So does your student success working group, um, if you like, have some power uh, to require things of different faculties? Or can they simply go their, their own way and, and choose from the smorgasbord um, as they like. Yeah, so um, 
Uh, I might get into trouble with my DVC here. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I don't think it's 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 a it's a secret, you know. Um the UCT, uh, like I think many other institutions, faculties are, are are entities unto themselves, and you really have to show them the value of the work that you're doing. You have to have a strong vision and sort of bring people along with you and find champions within those faculties. Um, to, to help you do that work. The Commerce Faculty is a very good example of how we found a champion in the Deputy Dean of Teaching and Learning um, to drive some of the academic advising work, for example. So um, I think mandates are, are quite difficult, um, but I think the fact that we have added into, the, um, into our governance structure now, Sia Pumalela, along with DAS, we report into the Data Analytics for Student Success Committee, which is a subcommittee of the teaching and learning, a Senate teaching and learning committee chaired by DVC uh, Cathard. So um, that is where our power currently lies. But I think uh, a lot of it has to do with just sheer will <laughs> of, of uh, vision and enthusiasm that brings people along sometimes, but it can be exhausting, yeah. I think it appears that you have lots of the vision and enthusiasm and your coach would like to uh, say congratulations for both your vision and your leadership in this coordinating role. And Sue Partha from UWC was also saying great presentation and I agree in Riyashna. It's been challenging but exciting challenging as we work, all of us work through these kinds of, of challenges. Um, and oh, from inside, Demokatsu says your leadership continues to inspire us. Well done. Oh, stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you very much indeed um, for putting together that presentation and for giving us some insight into um, the huge coordinating role that you're playing at, at UCT and always for linking it back to the system and building that system. So. Thank you very much indeed. And can we move now to um, the WITS team? I hope that the WITS team is here, both. Um, Kevin, there we go, I see you. <laughs> and Fazile, Fazile, are you there? Right, Kevin, are you going to be starting? I think you are. Yes, I'm gonna just try and share. Hopefully we won't have a similar problem. I think you've got a backup plan, haven't you, with um, yeah. hasn't Dream got it? <laughs> yes. But let's see. Mm. Um, are you seeing the slide? There we go. Mm. Okay, so <laughs> first of all, I just want to say that we're very fortunate for ha having been part of CEO Pumalela from its inception in 2014. And very grateful to Kresge for the funding that enabled us to build a capacity in using data analytics to support student success. We're also glad to see the expansion of the network to include the majority of institutions in South Africa because it provides an enriched context, context for uh, learning sharing between, between ourselves and for scaling student success efforts across the country. So over time, student success has become embedded in our thinking, our structures, our processes, and our systems uh, at WITS. We recently hosted a study for two, two African universities from Ghana and Dar es Salaam, which belong to the African Research University Alliance. And they were very interested in our integrated approach in using analytics to support student success. So the message is being evangelized beyond our borders even. We've come a long way, but in hearing the presentations from Tim Rennick and the other excellent presentations by the partner universities, it's reminded us we've still got a long way to go and we need to continue with the deep commitment and staying the course that was referred to by Francois Stradel. So we're going to show you a video now. Um, it's, four, it's four separate uh, presentations. It's about 24 minutes long. Uh, first is going to be Professor Ruxano Osman, Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic, which is going to be talking about a reflection on student success in initiatives during the last three years. That'll be followed by a presentation by Professor Diane Grayson, Senior Director of Academic Affairs. She'll be talking about the initiatives relating to student success 
in 2022. Then Mr. Mongezi Maluleka, the SRC project director, is going to talk a little bit about how they helped ensure that students were not disadvantaged in the move to online. And then finally, a short presentation by Mr. Sizwe Matlangu, a first year uh, student at FITS. So let's, uh, let's see if the video now plays. Greetings to colleagues and friends, and in particular to members of the Kresge Foundation. My name is Ruxana Osman, and I'm the Senior Deputy Vice Chancellor, Provost at Wits University. It's an absolute pleasure to be given this opportunity to speak very briefly about the last three years at Wits University, when all of the universities across the world have been dealing with COVID-19. Like all universities across the world, in 2020, March, we moved to emergency remote teaching in response to the global pandemic. And like all universities, we had to do this very quickly, very fast, and with the intention of ensuring that students' uh, teaching and learning was not disrupted. Of course, there were many difficulties and many people are starting to write about the, those difficulties, but I will use this opportunity to reflect what we in fact did in that period. So in the 2nd of April, the second block started and this was the beginning of emergency remote teaching. And part of this meant that every course had to be active on our learning management system. We had to ensure that students were supplied with data bundles. We adopted a laptop loan policy and some 500 laptops were procured and in fact couriered to students so that there was the least amount of uh, disruption to our students. In addition to data and laptops, students receive socio-emotional and academic support online and telephonically. Later in the year, a limited number of students returned to campus for social justice reasons and senior postgraduate students also returned to campus to complete work in laboratories and studios and so on. By the beginning of 2021, we had procured a new learning management system that was cloud-based, more powerful and more agile. And this LMS was Canvas, which we named Ulwazi, meaning knowledge in Zulu, which is consistent with our language policy. We also used the months of January, February and March in 2021 to transition the whole university to this new learning management system. About 100 webinars were put in place for training staff in the use of this new learning ma management system and all registered students were automatically registered to two student sites. One site to learn about Ulwazi and how to use Ulwazi and a second site on how to learn in an online mode. In 2021, like 2020, we brought back students in blocks of time to do some experiential work and some of their studio work. With the severity of COVID-19 diminishing and more of our students and staff being vaccinated, 2021 was the year in which we were able to bring in more students. And this gave us lots of experience in managing uh, students on campus and managing teaching and learning in an online mode. So by 2022 then, we adopted a blended learning approach. So 2020, we moved from emergency remote teaching to 2022, a blended learning approach, and we published a teaching and learning plan, which talked to this a blended philosophy and blended approach. 2022 is quite exciting. The campus is buzzing with students and staff. We, every course still has to be active on the Ulwazi site, but we are encouraging staff to encourage students to come in for more experiential work and then even more closer small group interactive work like tutorials. All clubs and societies are fully operational and in many ways you can sense the intellectual life of the university which is buzzing currently. The last three years have not been easy for staff nor for students, but I'm particularly grateful to the academic staff at Wits University for helping our students to transition 
in such a seamless way. And of course, for all the support staff who ensured that our academic staff got the support to de do the teaching appropriately. You will have an opportun opportunity to hear from the Senior Director for Academic Affairs, Professor Diane Grayson, who will tell you much more in detail about what we've done in 2022. And you will also hear some student voices which reflect on the last three years. Let me take this opportunity then to thank you very much for this uh, platform. And it's a wonderful platform to be able to share ideas and share experiences over the last three years. The main challenge really is to retain the good practices that COVID brought about in terms of teaching and learning and to join these practices with even better practices so that our students succeed in higher education. Thank you very much again for this opportunity. Greetings, I'm Diane Grayson, Senior Director, Academic Affairs at WITS. I want to speak about two particular initiatives related to student success this year. So in 2020, we formulated eight student success indicators, three lagging indicators and four leading indicators. The lagging indicators are increased completion rate, decreased time to completion, decreased disparities in completion rate by race and by gender, and the leading indicators are increased retention year-on-year, year, increased progression to the next year of study, sufficient credit points, decreased bottlenecks at the level of the course, and the uptake of advising captured on our intervention site. And BIS has our business intelligence services last year developed dashboards so that we can track each of these things. And they then put together data specifically for the Student Success Committee for us to look at twice a year, broken down by faculty and also in aggregate. The other thing that our BIS colleagues are doing is developing artificial intelligence models. And at the moment, there are four. So the first one looks at student academic performance, which predicts the success of our first year, first time students using their grade 12 school leaving results and also the biographical questionnaire that we have been administering uh, through the Siapu Malela support we've been receiving. The second one is a student persistence model which predicts the persistence of returning undergraduates. In other words, will they come back from one year to the next? The third one is a student completion in minimum time which predicts whether the students will complete their degrees in the minimum time. And then the fourth one is an unstructured data model where they're looking at the sentiment analysis of students based on comments they post on our Ulwazi or Canvas platform. So these four models are based on machine learning and some of them have been, the data has been turned into dashboards which we use to proactively identify students who need support. The second thing I want to talk about is what we did with our new first year students at the beginning of this year. So normally we run a one week orientation program for new first year students. Last year we couldn't do it because of COVID and so we did a fully online. This year we were really worried because our entering cohort of new first year students would have had two years of disrupted schooling and we were really concerned whether they would successfully be able to transition into university life. So enter Gateway to Success, which is an orientation to both academic and student life. It was a joint initiative of student affairs and academic affairs. And so the structure looked like this. It was three weeks long. It ran from the 7th to the 25th of February, just before classes started the following Monday. It was compulsory for all new first year students, about six and a half thousand students. We didn't charge any extra tuition fees. It was integrated, coordinated, a, a scheduled program of academic personal development and student life components. It was a mix of online and on campus activities. In the first two weeks, students came to campus for half a day of faculty based activities and another half a day of student life activities. And then in week three, all the on-campus activities were student life, but they still had online learning activities. The online academic and academic support courses were run fully on Ulwazi, which is 
our brand of Canvas. It's our learning management system, and this took place over all three weeks. So I want to show you the main content of the program. So there was academic content. There was a, an interdisciplinary, fully online course called Climate Change and Me, which was also writing intensive, and it integrated a number of uh, academic um, learning skills. And it earned the students who completed it a BITS short course certificate. And then there were faculty-specific fully online courses. There were also fully online academic support courses, one on digital abilities, one on academic integrity, because we know that this is a growing issue. Then there was mentoring, which was offered in a blended mode. So all the students were allocated a senior student uh, mentor from their faculty. So we had about 20 mentees per mentor. And some of the time, they met with their mentors and their mentor group on campus, and then they participated in WhatsApp groups outside of the time they were on campus. And the students will be part of that mentoring group with that mentor for the entire year. So we had about 365 mentors. And then the orientation activities, some on some run by student affairs, some faculty specific, and these were on campus. And then a number of student life activities offered in a blended mode related to health and wellness, personal development, community building, recreation, and fun. So just to show you what the components were in terms of time, so the online, fully online activities on Awazi, the climate change and me was a total of 25 hours. The digital abilities was a total of 20. The faculty academic content, another 25. And the academic integrity, five. So a total of 75 hours of fully online learning over the three weeks. Um, when I say hours, that is the hours that students were expected to put in, not the, the hours of actually um, asynchronous presentations. So this was to help them get used to using Ulwazi because we are teaching in a blended mode this year, some online, some on campus, and then also to address these important topics. In terms of the on-campus activities, so in weeks one and two, each faculty divided their students into two groups, and each group of students came onto campus twice, either in the morning from 8.30 to 12, or in the afternoon from 1 to half past 4. So if you look, for example, at the uh, commerce faculty, they had a student life session on Tuesday and a faculty-based session on Friday, uh, each group half a day. Um, so this was a way that we could restrict the number of students on campus, but make sure that every student got onto campus twice a week for half a day in week one and twice a week in week two. And during this time when they were on campus, they also met with their mentors and mentor groups. And then in week three, we had uh, the on-campus activities were student life, the academic and academic support uh, courses continued fully online up until Friday, and then Friday was the big closing, and it was the Vitz spirit game, and I, I thought I would just show you a few photos. Uh, so these two on the bottom left and middle are from the Vitz spirit game, so this was uh, the Vitz soccer club versus Orlando Pilot Pirates. And uh, during, during the course of this activity, the students get their t-shirts and they're encouraged to shout Bitsy for life. On the top left, you see one of the mentor groups. So the way we did the mentor groups is we allocated them to uh, the very, very large science labs. We have three very large science labs, and that way we could ensure so social distancing and the students can also sit together, as you see, in a group. I just put this middle one in because it's our VIT centenary year. And then on the right, you'll see some activities uh, in, in the faculty. This is one of the mentors in the bottom right. These are also mentors. So we were very excited. Here's a comment from a student. It was really amazing. I enjoyed every bit of it. The program really helped me feel welcome and comfortable. I know when I do start courses, I will be adequately prepared for anything. So this was a really exciting and great program, and uh, we're hoping to do something similar going forward. So thank you. Greetings to you all. My name is Mongezi Waluleka, and I'm the VETSRC project officer and the former academic officer of the VETSRC. Um, I'm just here to 
engage much on what are some of the initiatives that we had in place um, with the SRC and also um, with the university at large, you know, in terms of making sure that during online learning, our students are not disadvantaged. So um, remote learning was introduced on the 20th of April 2020, 2020 during the COVID era. I think it was the first few weeks of COVID uh, arriving in this country. Um, also, um, it was quite a stressful moment for us because we do not know um, how to navigate through an online or remote system. You know, the initiatives that VETS had was um, to provide data and mobile devices to students, which um, I believe um, they were one of the first institutions to respond to that call because we had to finish the academic year and not compromise the academic integrity of the institution. So um, rather it was, it was quite, um, not every student was privileged to get such, but we, we as the SRC tried our best to make sure that um, most of our students are catered for during that time because we did not want any student to be left behind. Um, some of the issues that students were facing are where, um, the environment that they had at home um, and also um, uh, network issues and mental health issues which uh, were addressed through distress zones and also we engaged with the faculties to be lenient on um, students getting deferral tests and exams and also we had engaged with faculties and universities to make sure that the they, 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 they mental health um, related facilities are made available online. So those are some of the initiatives that we have had between the 2020 and 2021 during remote and online learning because um, we, the university was not ready to come back to campus. But one of the issues that we had also faced was um, our academic integrity was slightly compromised during online and because more and more students were were um we found collaborating or cheating so one of the initiatives that we have had with the universities the src was to address the issues of academic integrity to go out there to students to ensure that they understand the grave danger of collaborating during assessments and tests and we had ensured that we we, we, we use um two-pronged approach uh, one one of the approaches that i used in my office was an online um and the physical one you know the university sent out emails to students and but at the same time it was not enough because the src has also much reach to students so i took it to myself and my team to ensure that we go out there and we, we, we tell students what it means, um, you know, to be a vet student, what it means um, to them if they collaborate or cheat during exams and how it compromises the integrity of the institution, the integrity of, of, of the degrees that they are trying to get. You know, so we, we collaborated with residences um, to ensure that we go out there physically um, and online to engage with them, to ensure that they, they know what it means to um to 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 be in an academic space you know because um most of our first years still believe we're just transitioning from high school to university but they do not understand um the responsibility that they carry when they get to university so um we also engaged on distress zones the university and the src collaborated in ensuring that we address mental health issues through distress zones on campus um, because we had to ensure that our students' mental health is not compromised. Um, we're not really uh, perfect in terms of addressing, but we're, 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 doing, uh, we're progressing very well on our side as the SRC to do more for our students and to collaborate with the with some of the institutions that exist on campus to address mental health issues but more on the academic side um you know we we went out there to just gauge our students in terms of um what, what are some of the things that they would like 
um for 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 the institution to implement you know and and one of the thing the key things that we we, we saw was that students felt as if the the learning management system that we used before was not really um was easy to navigate but at the same time did not offer more in terms of remote learning hence the institution also um, 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 um moved into a new learning management system which is Uluazi and um which is also easy to navigate but it offered more you know making it uh, easier for our students to learn remotely um quick assessments um you can be able to access your 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 your, your, your files easier um and files are easily grouped by lecturers and 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 tutors who are also uh, monitoring the, the the learning management system on their side so those are some of the collaborative events that we have had with the university and hence we had agreed rather um for us to use this new manage uh, learning management system and to also uh, have more of um, the mental health related um, programs with the university because we had to make sure that our students mental health is not compromised and we had to make sure that it is considered as number one issue that the university needs to address so well, we're still progressing well in terms of that regard and we have a mission and a responsibility to make sure that we have more collaborative events to ensure that our students are indeed in the safe hands in this src and the university because um quite generally the reputation um of um you know universities during this online learning um was changing you know students some students felt as if um universities are not doing enough so as the src we wanted to step up to to help um the universities to ensure that they give um our students what's best for them and to give them the other version of what students want their institution to look like so those are the things that we are engaging with uh going into this year and our centenary year and we quite believe that the university would respond uh, respond quite well in terms of that regard and thank you so much for this opportunity my name is Zizu Mashang. i'm from pumalanga in a city called emalashin i participated my metric in fh mkabela secondary school during these past five years, it has been difficult to study the school because we have less resources and our lab was used as a teacher's staff room. I'm currently a first year student studying Bachelor of Education, Senior Phase and FET, specializing in mathematics and natural science. I participating in this school specific mentorship program, it has really helped me a lot to deal with a lot of things such as stress. My mentor was Shalom Giovanna. We usually meet once a week because of the schoolwork. Participating in this program, it also helped me to navigate and familiarize myself within the university. My advice that I would give a first year is to participate in this program because it will help them to navigate through the university and get to know people around the university. I would like to thank Sia Pumelela for funding this school-specific mentorship program and it has been a fascinating journey to be at Advance and participating in this program and get to know different people from who are doing a different dimension of study as me. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Kevin. You're muted at the moment. Would you like to finish off after your video? Uh, there were a couple of questions, I think one from Wendy uh, asking about what we do with the first AI uh, model on pred prediction of success. So what we do is based on the metric marks and the biographical questionnaire, we can quite accurately uh, predict which students are at risk uh, before they even uh, set foot on campus. And those reports are made available to the student advisors so they can start uh, interventions quite quite early on and then as the uh, students engage at the university write uh, assessments and the marks are gathered we update those predictions on an ongoing basis uh, ongoing basis there was a question i think from janine asking what variables do we do from uh, use from the biographical questionnaire so it's things like um, is the student first generation and then 
what resources were available at school in terms of labs, laptops, um, um, library facilities, what was their home language, etc. cetera. Um, Fazile might be able to add uh, additional variables uh, to that. Fazile? Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, and good afternoon to colleagues. Um, yes, as Kevin has mentioned, uh, the biographical questionnaire is divided into three. Uh, we collect uh, data on students' background, home background, their school background, um, and we also have questions about the arrangements that they have made for their time um, in university. Um, the data is very rich and very uh, valuable um, and useful to various stakeholders across um, the university and really helps um, faculties, especially to have a well-rounded view of the profile of um, students in the incoming cohort. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Wendy, would you like to follow up or is that is your question being um, answered? No, that, that's fine. It's just the problem with predictive data like that is that it can be misused, students can be labeled, that sort of thing. But if it's being used proactively for advisors to contact students, and I've seen some of their, um, the, the, the um, dashboards that they develop um, as well, uh, which are very, very data rich. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as it's not being used to label students in advance and become sort of self-fulfilling prophecies. Yeah, we're very aware of the dangers of that. So we try to use it only for the students' good. Mm. Thank you. There was once a horrible phrase coined, which was using data to kill the bunny. So let's hope that that's not what, what is happening. And given your awareness, I, I doubt that that is, is the case. Um, well, thank you very much to, to the WITS team. And um, I would just like to ask you the same question I asked UCT, um, Kevin, which is I know WITS is extremely decentralized by in, into faculties. Um, do you feel that there's a um, uh, that the vision is carried through by all the faculties, or um, is is this still a work in progress? So there is a lot of autonomy to to the faculties, but the uh, student success committee was reconstituted. We had the student success framework. It was all done. Uh, by collaborating across the silos at the university. And I think there's a, a real uh, culture and buy-in to doing things together. Um, so yes, the, it's not kind of a top-down, it's across silos and together and getting the right representatives who can go back to the faculty and pass the message on and also bring back to the student success committee the real problem. So uh, I think it does have a real strong influence and through Professor Osman and uh, Professor Grayson, uh, that message is continually uh, reinforced. Great, thank you. We've got a question from Bill Moses. Um, Kevin, what advice do you have for other siloed universities to ensure the work can be made across, um, across the university? So I think the key is to have real representatives in the committees that make the decisions. So as being a representative, they both have, have to bring, they're responsible for bringing the message from their faculties and schools to the committee and taking messages back from the committee to the schools. So if, that, if they're not senior enough, that's not going to happen. And that two-way communication needs to happen. Uh, and I think obviously having the, the members drawn from uh, across the silos is very important. But I think and that well-constituted student success committee is very important, led by someone at the executive level. And, and a real um, advocate at, the, at that executive level. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed um, to the WITS team for, for that presentation. Um, I'm trying to keep to time because I do realize that it is extremely cold and late on a Thursday afternoon. So Bill, I know it's very early for you, um, but you have joined us on a very miserable day for South Africa, um, except perhaps for Nelson Mandela Bay because it's actually raining there and they need the rain desperately. But otherwise, 
probably one of the coldest and most miserable days we've had this this year. So um, thank you for joining us again from uh, far away. And um, yes, I'm going to hand over to you for some closing remarks because we didn't expect you to get up at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning tomorrow uh, to do this. Thank you, Jenny. And I, I want to uh, thank everyone at Sadie all of the Sia Pumala network and all of the conference participants, you not only have produced a great conference, you have made a huge difference and are making a huge difference in the lives of South African students. You know, one of the things that's uh, giving me great joy is literally just as an exchange with Kevin, um, is, is to, we have very experienced uh, institutions in this space now, sharing advice, supporting their peers, so they can, so everyone can move in, in uh, this direction of reform to support students. I've also heard great things about, you know, uh, UFS's work with Carnegie Math Pathways and developmental education, which we know is critical because of the learning losses that were resulting from uh, COVID, especially for students who are in primary school and graduated and starting the university education in the last two years. We've heard great things about basic needs and ensuring students are well served again, made even more uh, dire by COVID. We've heard about chatbots. We've heard about, uh, we've seen very sophisticated questions, analyses, and examples. And I, um, I sent an email to Tim Rennick. I said, you know, I, I thought um, he did a great job. But I said, I was so impressed with the level of questions and analysis that was coming from the, the uh, Siapumo audience. I also really appreciated the, um, the sophistication uh, not just of questions, but the thoughtfulness and the spirit of mutual support and partnership. Um, and finally, I just loved hearing from the students. I think that the, the last two videos in particular were just great. And, um, you know, what I wanted to say is sort of the evolution that we've seen in the student success movement. And one of the things is that when we started promoting student success in South Africa, we did it in response to VC saying this is the most critical priority for us. We're getting the students in, but they're not leaving with degrees. And you know, one of the things we found is that when we started promoting this, we weren't sure that what we were suggesting might work was actually going to work. And uh, when Georgia State first emerged as being able to dramatically increase attainment and remove equity gaps, we realized it was possible. Um, and you know, that came out of this ethical responsibility that they felt they had. Um, but they also were using innovative tools like data analytics. Then the next question that came up was, well, it's not true. Well, um, that we consistently has been proven that it is working. If it wasn't working, I'm sure we'd be reading about it all the time. Um, and then the next one was, well, it's unique to Georgia State. And that's also been refuted. We're seeing universities in the United States, Florida International University, UC Riverside, Florida Atlantic University, um, all seeing this kind of success. We're also seeing success in South Africa. We're seeing a degree attainment in increasing. Um, we're seeing uh, uh, throughput, what we of course call graduation rates in improving. Um, we're even possibly seeing some improvements here and there on uh, the equity gaps. And you know what, what is interesting though, is that we're, the overwhelming conclusion we're getting from leaders in the student success space across the world is that data analytics and evidence-based reform can offer the solutions needed for student success, but that the most effective solution ensuring student success is the institutional approach. The real solution is changing institutional behaviors to center students. It's looking in the mirror and analyzing how an institution's own practices that, that may be outdated, well-intentioned, or added in isolation from the needs of its students are impeding success. It's not how do we make students university ready, but how do we make our institutions student ready? And how are we determining that what we're doing is what's needed? Are we conducting surveys? Are we looking at data? Are we conducting focus groups to see why students are succeeding or why they're failing? And given that information, what are we doing now that we have that information? Are we saying, well, fiddle dee dee, there's not much we can do. You know, NISFAS is a disaster. Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but what can you do? What's within your responsibility to change to help mitigate any challenges that may be beyond your own uh, campuses? And, and so that really is, you know, what are we doing to ensure that our students not only persist to graduation, but that they have the 
the skills and the quality credentials that will allow them to thrive over a lifetime. You know, looking forward, we're seeing South African institutions pursuing most, maybe not, maybe all of the interventions and approaches that I'm hearing about in the United States. Uh, I think South Africa is probably the leading country along with the United States in looking at student success, looking at racial equity, looking at what can be done at the institutional level to improve students' uh, outcomes. I guess my question for you though is, are your approaches as good as they can be? Are you learning from your South African and international peers? Um, you know, are you really looking at ways you can improve developmental education? A chatbot is not a chatbot is a chatbot. Some chatbots are good and some chatbots are horrible. Um, are your chatbots good? Remember, not all chatbots are the same. You know, what are the best ways for you to, um, to support your students most effectively? And what are your peers, uh, whether it's down the road or um, across the ocean, what are they doing that you think might be helpful? So a big question I think for us, uh, certainly at Kresge and at Sadie and maybe among some of you is what comes next? Um, the grant right now is gonna be ending at, at sort of the end of 2023 based on some of the, the, the saved uh, money we had during COVID and or into the first quarter of 2024. Um, I can't guarantee we'll continue, but if we do, what would be your priorities? I'm not asking for it right now. I'm just asking you to be thinking about this. Um, you know. Uh, what do you think would be really helpful to, to make this even more effective? Would it be setting specific quantitative goals for attainment? Would it be expanding the network? Would it be um, you know, serving, supporting certain kinds of interventions that seem especially effective in South Africa? Um, and that would be good. And then the other question, of course, I want people to be thinking about is, well, if Kresge doesn't support financial or financially this work beyond 24, what will you, your institution, and the Sia Pumalola Network do to continue the momentum we've all seen? Because you know, one of the lessons from Georgia State's work was that it didn't require a lot of money from outside donors to make those changes. They shifted money from one thing to a different thing, and then they saw outcomes improve. A couple of things, just so it's on your radar. I will be in South Africa, God willing, the weeks of October 3rd and uh, the weeks of October 10th. I definitely plan to be in Johannesburg and Pretoria and Cape Town and, and Bloemfontein. Uh, and Sadie, I think, is going to be trying to see if we can convene in person at some point. And so, um, you know, that may be a great opportunity for us to start thinking about what could be the next steps. What are we learning? What are we doing? Another thing just for everyone to keep in mind is that uh, right now, I assume Achieving the Dream is going to have its first dream conference since the last major event all of us attended in February, 2020. And that will be in Chicago the week of February 14th to 17th. So you might wanna think about who from your institution uh, might you recommend attend uh, DREAM. Again, that's all up to Achieving the Dream and it's all up to you know who that ends in a 19 as to whether we're going to have something in uh, Chicago in the winter of uh, 2023. But nevertheless, um, uh, it's good to plan like who might represent you and why so that you have a, a really terrific final year. Um, so I just wanna thank all of you. I hope it gets warmer. I hope it gets drier in Cape Town, warmer in Johannesburg and Bloemfontein and basically every place but uh, uh, Durban and that you have a, a wonderful final morning while I will be blissfully sleeping and while you're working. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Bill, um, for, for those words. I think you have left us with some challenges. I just wanted you, um, to reiterate some of the sentiments that uh, we've heard during the course of the presentations, uh, many of which you possibly you were not able to be. Um, and it was really to acknowledge um, the, the vision of the Kresge Foundation um, and acknowledge um, the resources that you've put in uh, in a very, very strategic way within the South African uh, higher education system. Um, and because it's, it's not been hugely expensive what, what has happened, but it has acted as a catalyst um, to bring a whole range of activities together, give them purpose and to ensure that they, they talk with each other. So I would like to, on behalf of the whole group, um, Thank you very much indeed for, for your commitment 
Um, and I guess we hope that the Kresge Foundation will stay the course um, so that we can continue this work, but I'm sure we will also club together in some way to ensure that there are other ways in which we can continue this work um, as well. So um, there are very many sort of appreciative uh, comments in the chat. I think you've seen them already um, because you have responded. Um, and thank you again. And on that note, I'd like to wish you um, all um, a warm evening, maybe a hot cup of cocoa, some mulled wine, something of that kind. Um, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock for our last very short session. Um, to complete Siepo Malela 2022. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>